Hi, Jerome. Nice to see you. Likewise. <laughs> so thanks for uh, having a little chat with me for priceless advice with leaders of volunteers. And uh, as we were kind of warming up before we uh, started an interview, chatting a little bit about other stuff, it's a uh, it's pretty interesting working at home. It's not really working from home. It's <laughs> yes. How's that going for you? It's been tough. I think uh, you know a lot of people who know me know that I like having sort of a physical distance between where I work and where I play. And like this right here is my sanctuary, my my sanctuary. So this is like where I live. And um, so it's been tough making that adjustment of doing both work and play from uh, my living room essentially. Yeah, I've had I've moved from room to room. This is my living room. This is my metronome and some funny bird art in, in the background. And we also you and I have recently discovered that there are fancy zoom backgrounds, but usually I actually like to use a real a real depth of field <laughs> in a room yeah. um, and not accidentally disappear like a ghost or poltergeist in the green screen of, of the zoom background. So how are you not only just adjusting to very different workflow and, and work schedule, but you're, you've got a very successful blog website. I love your articles. You had a fantastic, you. Uh, I had a, you had a fantastic nine uh, stages of volunteer engagement video that came out. So, and you're balancing, you know, working in corporate social responsibility sector as well. Uh, and you probably never sleep, but tell us, tell us how that, how that flow and balance has been for you, you know, these last few months as we're, we're responding to COVID-19. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been challenging to say the least. Um, you know, what most people don't know is, um, you know, I'm very active on social media now, a lot more now than, than ever before, because I've actually been furloughed. So, you know, even though I work for a, a you know, a fortune company, um, you know, we furloughed and have laid off, I would imagine, tens of thousands of associates, me being one of them. And, um, and, you know, as a member of the social impact team, one of the biggest challenges that I've faced now is, um, you know, I'm duty driven. So, mm -hmm. like, when the community needs the most support now, more than ever before in my generation, in my lifetime, I have to sit on my hands. And so, um, so the, for me, the silver lining is that it's allowed me to re-explore other things. And so I've been a lot more active in exploring things that are not related to the, the company I work for, um, but still within corporate responsibility while also picking up a full-time job back in the nonprofit sector where I got my, where I got my start, which is mm -hmm. great because for me, one of the most important things for me is that I'm able to stay connected to my roots. Right. And I love your background and your, I don't know, I think you're famous within our sector. I think you're a celebrity. I think we'll get uh, people tuning in. You've got, um, I think, a great brand of sustainable AF. Uh, and is that the shirt you're wearing now or are you wearing a different shirt? Yeah, it's oh, uh, responsible. Uh, that's it. Oh, responsible as yeah. fuck. Yeah, that's it. Responsible as bleep. That's fine. You know what? I, I told, I told it's, you. You know, it's all rated. You it's know, all whatever. Ra it's all rated. <laughs> it'll, it'll be bleeped out in the transcript. I, I clicked the button on YouTube that these videos are not for children. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so in, in kind of the great pause, I have a lot of friends and colleagues, I, I work for myself, so there's a type of furlough that, you know, everybody's budgets went kablooey and, and in-person speaking went kablooey and, and some is shifting to virtual and I'm doing more of my pro bono work, which feels great and still some contract work, but it's so many of us, and I've talked to other colleagues in the situation who are with, you know, major government entities or major global corporations or major global nonprofits who are furloughed and they're still getting called for help every day. Like, how do we still run the things are you are you having that same phenomenon or are you just turning yeah it off? so you know strangely enough before we actually hit our official furlough date um tens of thousands of those who work at the company i work for um created a facebook page and so there are tens of thousands of employees who are on this facebook page and it's for us as associates, it's an opportunity to be resources for each other mm -hmm. as people file for unemployment and as people are looking for 
the food bank or looking for advice or suggestions, uh, potentially, you know, um, opportunities to get part-time work while they're on this furlough. Um, and so, um, you know, um, I've not done a, a, a ton of work in there, but like I know some of my colleagues uh, who I work with, um, they've been on there posting resources and, you know, everything that they could, they, that they could possibly, um, you know, put in there as a resource for uh, other employees. Uh, you know, for myself, of, of course, um, you know, you know, I, and this is, you know, something personal to me, but I just, I have to work and I have to be able to do something and, and give back constantly. And so I was able to uh, find full-time employment, which I'm incredibly uh, fortunate for in, in, in the sector supporting military families. So it's something I'm mm. incredibly passionate for, but, you know, I found a different way to um, respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but I think everybody right now is in that survival mode. Absolutely. And I just did a, a little Tuesday tip uh, a couple of weeks ago that we're in the same storm and, and very, very different boats. Everyone's boat is different. Um, and it can be really cloying when you see, you know, there's a lot of jokes about, oh, celebrities from their mansions, we're in this together. It's like, not really. They're really different situations to <laughs> roll in. And our clients and our, and our volunteers that we know are in, you know, vastly different uh, situations as well. And it's important to recognize that. How, how do you see this uh, kind of affecting, I know another of our shared passions is sustainability and uh, ecosystems and the climate and, and environmentalism. Like what, are, are you seeing changes on that front? Are you seeing that in your work Absolutely. with veterans? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, it's sort of a double-edged sword. I think as we have stopped um, transiting with mass transit or our own personal vehicles, we've seen uh, you know the 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 uh, uh, you know the CO two the carbon emissions uh, be reduced, um, and we've also seen um, you know wildlife in places that are urban who uh, you know that have not seen wildlife like that in, in decades, and so we're seeing we're seeing a, sort of a shift in um, the, you know, the wildlife coming back and the environmental, uh, you know, the environmental, um, status sort of uplifted. But I think the thing that I always want people to be, um, more cautious about is making sure that in our overabundance of caution to be more safe in protecting ourselves from the virus, that we don't take a couple steps backwards. And the, the, the couple specific, you know, uh, Examples I'll use is single-use plastic. Yeah. Right now, more yeah. than ever before, are people ordering things? They are uh, packaging things individually for you know the sake of you know self-preservation, but then also to to make sure that we're all uh, not exposed to something so dangerous like COVID-19. And what I would hate to see is all the work that we did in 2018 and 2019, where we eliminated plastic straws and plastic wrap on everything that we're sort of steadily going back that same direction um, in a knee-jerk reaction. Um, you know, we, even when you go to the grocery stores right now, you know, a lot of grocery stores are not allowing, um, you know, the reusable recycled bags. And I love using those. And, you know, a lot of grocery stores are turning people away and are going back to those, those one-time use, single-use bags. And so it's sort of a, uh, it's a double-edged sword. Um, I think there are some silver linings that uh, that we'll see from this. Uh, I think people will finally see, and this will be the time where it's sort of a light bulb, you know, over the head moment, where people will see that there is a correlation between reduced driving and reduced carbon emissions, and maybe that actually has an impact, and maybe there's something that we should be doing more. And so I'm not completely um, I'm not completely pessimistic about this. I, I think we'll see a couple steps back, but I, I think um, we're ushering in a different era of social responsibility and sustainability. It might take us beyond 2021 to realize that, but I think we're um, we're we're going to see a transformation here shortly. Uh, I have enjoyed uh, hearing the coyotes a little more uh, in the park behind me and having. Uh, have, seeing them in, you know, North Beach in Little Italy in San Francisco running around. So that, that wildlife enthusiast part of me is like, great, they're coming back. And what I'm hoping is the case is that not only do we see that we can work remotely more often, even though there's inherent challenges in working at home, that's from home, but under ideal circumstances, doing more 
reducing a carbon footprint of maybe not traveling in person so much and, and not having to, you know, having virtual speakers or TED Talk type things instead of um, flying to physically be at a conference. I'm hoping that that's part of the change that, that comes out of this as well. And again, that we don't get so caught up in, you know, a more unequal system where there's a certain class of people who can afford to have things delivered to them constantly and it's really wasteful or they're bored. Um, and everyone else who, you know, are performing the frontline dangerous services of that, including volunteers, include there's still, um, you know, Meals on Wheels and things coming to, to elderly neighbors of mine that are coming in their van and with their, their food every day to help them out. And uh, some of the pro bono and, and contract clients that I have been working with has been around advising the usual stuff in our sector right now of, of the 93% that's shut down uh, and, and furloughed, both colleagues like this, but the 7% that isn't is overloaded. So how do you deal with um, volunteers just showing up on the doorstep uh, if you're not ready for them? But also, you and I have talked quite a bit before about 70% of the volunteering that happens is informal, is mutual aid, is people just doing their thing. And we're seeing so much more of that happen as well and I think a lot of agencies are going to just get, uh, could have the, the danger of being left in the dust for this enthusiasm and this engagement and this, you know, what people want to do if they're not ready for it or not lined up. Are you, how is it working with your, with your job, with your veterans group? Are you running into that? Are there too many volunteers? Are there not enough? Is it a different model? Yeah, so um, I think as an organization, we're um, very fortunate to be able to deliver the services that we provide to military families, um, a lot of which can be done virtually, remotely, over the phone, you know, through a non-contact type of, of delivery system, which is fantastic. The challenge now is that in places where we have had in-person type of volunteer engagement, um, there is still a rising increase of expectation that we have something virtual for just the general everyday volunteer, mm. um, which, you know, which, you know, I, I always find that it's a challenge to um, balance the needs of the community versus the expectations of what people want to do, because what people want to do don't necessarily line up with the needs of the community. And, and I've, I've found that in this now virtual environment where, um, you know, volunteers, they want to do more virtual stuff, the volunteers that have an opportunity to do things virtually are oftentimes uh, the skills-based volunteers. And um, so, it, so, so it's been, it, I mean, it's been tough, I mean, to say the least. Yeah, and there's that odd imbalance where, people want some, they re still require a lot of in-person services. Um, and we're seeing whole new populations of people in food insecurity and housing insecurity because of, you know, 25% unemployment rate and, and everything that's happening kind of as a result of the pandemic that's really exaggerated uh, the lack of social safety nets that's already <laughs> been existing here for a while. So. Uh, someone in an earlier uh, call today said that they, a family member of theirs works in a grocery store, is a clerk in a grocery store, and, and was asked, what are you seeing in the difference with, with customers? And she, she replied, the nice people are nicer and the mean people are meaner. So it's kind of, <laughs> we're working with a lot of extremes uh, yeah. of, of situations. Uh, I'm really glad to see a lot of new partnerships come up and just, again, that mutual aid, spontaneity of people realizing, oh, this service doesn't exist in my neighborhood, but I can do a contact list or I can, you know, this person doesn't know how Instacart works, so they don't have internet or, or they don't have a way of accessing these kind of delivery services, but I can make sure that their needs are met with or without, you know, one of the nonprofits or the government agencies that's already here. And at least in the Bay Area, there's been, you know, levels of partnerships between cities and counties and nonprofits that was dreamed of before. So that's kind of a silver lining that's coming up. But when it's being done well, uh, hopefully that sticks around and those kinds of partnerships and innovation and how can we merge our programs to cover all these new 
new, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that now require services that didn't before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was going to say, you know, um, I too have seen some silver linings from this, you know, even though a majority of the services that we provide as an organization from our staff can be delivered, you know, virtually and remotely, while not leaving a lot of opportunities for volunteers, um, you know, the, the silver lining for us is that, um, you know, we've been able to make that pivot. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, uh, again, it, it's been a challenge, but we've, we've been able to make that pivot in terms of the services uh, that we provide directly uh, to the, the families that we support. And now with your veterans group and also coming from, you know, CSR uh, field as well, that disconnect, and you've talked about this in a lot of your great articles between, you know, what people want to do, whether it's a corporate team or a community group or, or, you know, club, service club, whatever, with what actually has to happen on the ground or, or what really serves the agency's mission. Um, do you have a secret sauce for that? Or is that just you figure it out as you go? <laughs> oh, gosh, you know, I wish I had a secret sauce to it. Um, you know, the one thing that I'll always share with people, especially those from the nonprofit sector, whether they work in human services or ministry or education, um, is that you know I secretly work to get more people with nonprofit sector backgrounds into corporate social responsibility roles. And uh, to me, you know, this isn't playing checkers, but it's playing chess. Mm -hmm. And you know, the end goal of this chess match is to get more people who have your and I's lens when we're seeking to serve the community into those roles of you know decision making for corporations in serving the community um, because that is when you're able to remove some of those barriers and that's i think is when you're able to um, better serve the population through the lens of the population that you're seeking to serve yeah uh, absolutely and uh, it's amazing being in such a tech heavy area of san francisco and silicon valley and having so many friends in the sector and uh and sometimes their companies are either adding a csr or looking to it and they'll send me the links to share among everybody else or and all that and i'll say almost it almost never has be a cva have mm -hmm. volunteer management experience it's you know have an mba have public policy, have marketing, other human market, resource. Mar marketing yeah, communications, everything, everything, everything but that, yeah. and not recognizing that all of those hats, to use uh, Elisa's word, all of those hats are what makes a leader of volunteers. <laughs> all, all of the pieces of skills from those other job descriptions and and it just, uh, you know, for, I know it frustrates you, it frustrates me, it just breaks my heart that it's like someone's going to get set up to not really do this very well, or they're going to keep doing it the way that it's been done uh, by the corporate policy, and they're going to wonder why they keep getting the same results when they keep hiring different people, but with the exact same background versus that that real perspective of what is it like to have boots on the ground on the, the nonprofit or the government agency side of uh, having things for large groups of or you know teams of volunteers to do and drop in or, or episodic ways, so hopefully you know the work that you're doing in your amazing writing and your blogs and doing more videos and hopefully some of the work I'm doing front of house and behind the scenes with different organizations will pay off in that way. Uh, kind of wrap, wrapping up uh, chatting here. What do you? see in the future for the next you know six months or a year for the sector how do you see uh coming out on the other end of this and and what what do you what do you hope a new normal looks like so i think a couple different things um i think i have sort of a realistic i have the realistic idea of what that is and then sort of the pipe dream of what that probably should be uh so i think realistically we're going to come out of this and i think uh, from a social good perspective, I think people will be more responsible. Companies will be more responsible in the way that they operate. Um, a part of that will be to, you know, to, to be more um, conscious about how we're serving the community in this great time of need. But then I think also society is going to have a greater expectation of how companies support and how nonprofits support and how the government acts moving forward. 
um, I, I think long term, like if you're thinking beyond six to you know six months to a year, um, you know what I'm more hopeful for for the corporate responsibility sector um, is that you know, and I and I've seen a shift of this just over the last two and a half years, but more you know professionals from you know uh, human services, education, ministry, the nonprofit sector at large, activists making their way into the, the corporate responsibility sector. Because I think, you know, as I ascend professionally, I become that decision maker of who to hire and who do I want to work with. And I, and I think that's changing quite a bit, especially with younger generations getting in. Absolutely. Um, well, it's always really great to talk to you. We didn't, like get, we didn't get to any recipes this time or what you're cooking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, everything is relegated to what I can get from my farmer's market. And, I, and I'll yeah. tell you this, uh, you know, just very briefly, um, you know, uh, I am still ordering all my groceries, but I've been very fortunate to order, be able to order all of my groceries for my, from my local farmer's market, which is so yes. great. Yes. So local, um, you know, supporting yeah. local businesses, um, but it's all relegated to what's seasonally and yeah. regionally, right? Exactly. Yeah. And again, I'm extremely fortunate that I'm in California and we are, we grow a lot of food, uh, right? Even not that far from the Bay Area. So uh, same kind of thing. We've been able to, to get stuff sourced locally and it's pretty healthy. And I know that that's been uh, an absolute blessing <laughs> during this time of uh, being sheltering in place and, you know, doing our best to protect ourselves and protect the community. And um, I know you also enjoy running. Are you able to get out and about and do that? Do you, are you huffing and puffing through a mask? Or are you just running away from people? <laughs> no, I huff and puff through a mask. And, and honestly, uh, you know, even through the winter when I run, I wear a face mask or, or something anyways. And so I'm used to it. So it doesn't really bother me. Matter of fact, I ran this morning, did seven miles and I run maybe every other day, but uh, you know, I get out really early. I'm an early riser. So, you know, five o'clock in the morning is probably the latest that I get out for a run. And, you know, all I see are the foxes and the deer and the rabbits and the squirrels here. Yeah. At that early, you know? Yeah. It's wonderful. And again, wildlife coming, coming back, coming full circle to, mm -hmm. to that thing. Well, Jerome, I hope you stay happy, healthy, well, in all of this. And likewise. Thank you so much, and we will uh, chat again soon and exchange some recipes for some good home cooking. All right, thanks. Thanks for having thanks so me much. again. Be well.